I don't know what part of the world you're from, but here in North Georgia, US of A, it's starting to get a little warm out and the people are starting to flock to the lakes. So I think it's about time we dig into this Sea Dew jet ski. This boat was given to me by one of my customers and it's an older ski, but supposedly it runs and it's just been sitting for a couple of years. So what we're gonna do today is dig into this thing and take a look and see what we got. As you can probably see, it's been sitting around all winter underneath the cypress trees. All of the controls are working nice and free. I like that. Well, it looks like it's got a little over a half a tank of fuel, which is fantastic. That'll go right in the tundra. We'll put some fresh non-ethanol in this thing. I think before I do anything, first things first, let's get it cleaned up. This ski's really in good condition for its age. Uh, granted, it's going to need a polish and a wax. The gel coat is a little dusty looking. So before I go any further on this, uh, I'm going to do a compression test. I just want to see what kind of condition this engine is in. I always want to remember to ground these out on this little tab behind the engine. And the reason I want to do that is so that there's no back feed of the electrical current back into the CDI unit, which could cause damage to it. Plugs are a little tight in there. Got a little rust in there. Actually, let's spin it over before we even put the compression tester in. I don't know if this battery is just too dead. Sweet, she spins over nice. I think I need time for a new jump box. I'm not getting a tick under a hundred. That's not great. But much better than zero. And about 75 on this one. Uh, I'd be willing to bet that these rings are stuck in this piston a little bit from sitting. Squirt a little two stroke down there and uh, retest it. And 
I brought that cylinder up to about 125. So that's fantastic news. This is the rings are sticking a little bit. I'm gonna squeeze a little non-ethanol fuel mixed with two cycle oil. Put the plugs back in and see if this thing will at least snap off. That's a real good sign. I get into getting this fuel system cleaned out. We know we got a good ignition system. And the engine seems to be fairly solid. So this may be an easy fix. Let's get this tank drained and see what we got in there. If we got water or varnish, whatever. I actually just realized that the moron had the gas off while we were cranking it. However, I feel like this is irrelevant because I'm gonna drain this fuel tank anyhow. And then we'll put some fresh gas and try it again. And then we'll see if we have to rip into the carburetors. That's yeah, not too bad. We'll spray that out a little bit. So, you know, I should be a little bit more conscientious of the fuel being off. I've actually had customers bring me bikes where they were literally out of fuel. That was all that was wrong with it. They didn't even check the gas tank. You know, of course I charged them for a full engine rebuild, but you know, you gotta teach them a lesson. Ugh. You're gonna fight me, isn't you? gasoline. Alright, let's drop a hose down in here and pull a sample. Try to get this at the lowest possible point because the fuel is lighter than water and it will float on top of water. So if there's any water in the tank, you want to get to the lowest point of the tank. That's not too terribly bad. I don't see any water. Now, if there's any water, you would see this the gas floating on top of it. I'll give you an example. I'll put some water in it. As you can see, there's an extremely distinct line between the water and the fuel. And if there was any water in there, obviously, this is what it would look like. And you want to get all of that out. But what I'm going to do is drain this entire tank and dump this in my truck and we'll put some fresh non-ethanol in here. All right, let's give this a shot. I know it's gonna take a little bit to get the gas up to the carburetor.
Well, let's see if we flooded it. It's a little soggy. Now that I turned the fuel back on to reserve, there might be some bad fuel making its way into the carburetor. Try this again. Before I run it too long, let me get some water on it. And I'm not 100% sure how you get water on this ski. I literally see no place to hook up a hose. There's a connection right here. Well, if that's where you hook a hose up or whatever, I don't know, it's old school. Water's a little cold. Right, got no water coming in, which is good. Definitely pumping water through the engine. That's fantastic news. I don't know if this thing's gonna have any thrust. Pulled the cord out somehow. That's weird. How did I do that? So, all right. So one thing I'm noticing straight away is this thing is cavitating right out of the hole. In other words, the water is bypassing the impeller rather than shooting out the back. And what causes this generally is a blockage and the um, water intake system or more than likely it's a sea dew the wear ring is bad on this the wear ring is a plastic ring that goes in the jet pump that keeps a tight tolerance to the impeller that forces the water straight out the back uh, guaranteed that's going to be the issue with this they're very common and fairly easy to do but the ski actually runs very well and that's why it's not getting a lot of up on that's why it's not getting up on a plane real fast and real easy because it's cavitating and you can hear when i rev this thing out it immediately goes on to the rev limiter so it's it's not pumping or pushing the water like it's supposed to if i go slow it's probably not bad
Well, revving it out uh, under full throttle for a while, she kind of shuts off and starts right back up again. So I don't know if the oil pump is acting up or something else. So that's something else I'm gonna have to get into. All right, now back at the house. I'm gonna take a look and see what's going on with this. Uh, at the lake, it shut off on me a couple times. The only way I was able to get back to shore was to just idle it in. It almost sounds like it just locks up, but she cranks right away and starts right back up again with no issue. I'm gonna check the oil feed on this and make sure that filter is clean. We may have to get into the pump. And also we're gonna pull this jet pump out and take a look at the sleeve and get that replaced. Well, we're going to work sort of in the garage today. There's more rain coming in. So first things I'm going to do here is get our jet nozzle, our steering nozzle off. And that's right here, 10 millimeter. Also, we're going to get our reverse bucket disconnected from the cable. That's also a 10 millimeter. Always a good idea to take a second to put your bolt back where, you, where it came off of. This way you're not scrambling when everything's apart to try to figure it out. On either side of this assembly there's a heavy spring that we have to take off and this is what holds this rear bucket up. And you can use a spring hook or just grab them with a pair of pliers if you can. It's kind of a tough spot to get in. Now you can go ahead and get your four main bolts off and a whole jet pump nozzle assembly and reverse bucket will come off. Sometimes with salt, this is easier said than done. This is a fresh water machine, so lucky, lucky. So on the back of the nozzle here, there are two ports and they also go into the jet pump. What these two ports are as, as this jet assembly, because it goes from bigger to smaller, the pressure actually increases in here and it will force water into this port in here up and that's how it feeds the engine with the cooling water the second one if you notice has a longer tube this gets out of that pressure port because it's in the smaller section and that creates an actual vacuum as the water rushes by and what that's for is your bilge pump so as the water rushes by it creates a suction the hose runs inside your hull and there's a little pickup screen there that sucks the water out of the hole when you're under under um, motion so on camera I'm not 100% sure how well this is going to show up but this is the root of our propulsion problem uh, if you see the impeller which is the silver piece right here and our wear rings on the inside there's a huge huge gap that's supposed to be about a millimeter and that's probably about three millimeters and it's very common on these sea dews uh, these are plastic wear ring and that wear ring wears as sand and debris or anything else runs through it and that's what it's made to do so they're fairly easy to replace i'm going to go ahead and pull the rest of this jet pump off and that's done by removing the last four bolts Sometimes these may be a little bit difficult to get off the hull. They are siliconed in pretty good. I'm going to try and get in there with this angleable pry bar. But if that doesn't work, we'll have to take the ride plate off. And we should be able to get up there and just kind of maneuver it out with some tool, screwdriver or something. You want to be very careful that we don't break this. I don't put too much pressure on it. Take your time, work it out. So if 
feels pretty loose. There is a chance that your drive shaft could be stuck in the impeller as well. So what's happened is the entire drive shaft has come out with it. Not a big deal. Now you can get a closer look at the gap on this wear ring and why instead of the water pressurizing and going out the back, it would rather just go around the impeller and that's that cavitation you're getting. So it's this plastic sleeve here that we're going to replace. All right, so we got her on the bench. Bearings don't sound too bad. Obviously, we need to get this shaft out of here. And if it's really stuck, you have to peel this boot back, spray a little penetrating spray, lightly tap on the impeller, see if you can get it to come loose. This one here feels like she wants to cooperate. So there we have it. Looks pretty good. We'll clean all this up and we'll put some marine grease back on it when we put it together. But the way I want to put this together is get this back in the engine side first. And then when we put the jet pump back on, we'll just slide it back on here. So just to give you a reference, uh, this fuel gauge is 0.9 of a millimeter. Uh, I don't have a one millimeter, but it's really negligibly larger than this. And that's the, the width of the gap that's supposed to be around here. Now, if you take your time and work on this inner sleeve, you can take this out and replace it without pulling the impeller off. However, I want to pull the impeller off because I'm going to do a service on this rear bearing and check all the seals and the bearings inside to make sure that they're okay. And to do this, you're going to need an impeller removing tool. You can pick these up off the jungle website or the auction website or just about anywhere on the internet. Next, you can mark the orientation of this cone. It's not really necessary if you, as long as you remember that the fill and drain plug points sort of to the top. Now we're going to pull this off and this is gear lube in here and this stuff stinks. Can already smell it. There's an O-ring in here and this thing is plastic so you just want to be gentle with it. break this loose you're going to need a crescent wrench or adjustable wrench i'm using a 15 16 i believe that's like 22 millimeter or 23 millimeter i don't know what it equates to but this is what i've got and it works now i'm not going to say that this is easy you got to put some tension on it so what we're going to do is throw this on the floor so we can use our philly cheesesteak weight on it wasn't so bad some of these are real tight you want to examine the prop edges make sure there's no major gouges you're gonna always have a little bit of wear on your leading edge pretty common as it chops through the water and hits sticks and rocks and fish and people you know it's going to put some marks on it so you have a thrust bearing in here and then there's also a washer all this stuff clean everything up in here real real good with some acetone 
you have a bearing on the outside and you have a bearing on the inside and then you also have a seal it's always a good idea to go ahead and replace the seal so I'm gonna order one of these as well I just did one of these jet pumps a couple of these jet pumps on a sea dew boat that I picked up and I'm not sure if that video is gonna come out before this one or not but I learned my lesson about not ordering the seals ahead of time so next thing we want to do is get this sleeve out of here and you can get in here and chisel away at it try to break it with a screwdriver this one's real thin what I'm going to use is a Dremel tool to cut a couple of slots in this and it falls right out so what I've got here is just a high-speed rotary tool and the bit I've got here is a like drywall cutting bit and it works really good on this now there's you can see the thickness of the sleeve and we don't want to cut it any further than that we don't really want to cut into this housing I mean if you put a couple little scratches into it or small gouges it's not going to be a big deal but you don't want to come out the other side so don't keep grinding get the safety glasses on I call it safety glasses but it's just technically I can't see so I have to use glasses technically don't have to go all the way down to the metal you want to get it close just enough to break this piece out now you can get in here and try to pry this out it's actually really kind of a pain to get this thing out, but a blind hole bearing puller is your best bet. And what these do is it has these expandable flutes. As you tighten the center rod, it will expand these flutes. Um, you just want to go past the seal and not grab the bearing. Like I said, these things can really be a pain to get out. Kind of tricky to know where that bearing ends and where the sleeve for the seal starts. If you grab the bearing, you're going to destroy it. Sometimes it's better to work with gravity. There she is. Now it's always recommended to go ahead and replace your bearings while you're in here. These don't seem like they're in really bad shape. I'm going to go ahead and clean them up along with the shaft and everything else with some acetone. And also I'm going to clean up this housing a little bit, get some of the corrosion off of it using a wire wheel. All right, we got our parts for our jet pump. Let's go ahead and get our new seal put in. Get this housing cleaned up as best as I could. Now, obviously, if you had a sandblaster or something, that would be fantastic. Go ahead and clean it all up real good. And repaint it or powder coat it. I'm not too, too worried about it. I just wanted to get a lot of the corrosion out of this area here. Now, I'm going to go ahead and grab my sleeve, which I threw in the freezer a couple hours ago. The cold will shrink the sleeve and make it slightly easier to put in. Now, if this didn't have these plastic tubes on here, you could probably throw this housing in your oven at you know 250 degrees 300 degrees or something like that being a um, metal housing and that would expand this and still make it easier to put this together so when this thing equalizes it should lock this sleeve in there solid where it won't come out won't move you can already feel it's stuck let's see what kind of clearance we have with this new sleeve look at that
CDU is recommending a red thread locker on the threads. Now go ahead and torque this nut to 52 foot pounds. If the impeller rubs the sleeve a little bit, don't worry about that. It will wear itself in, and sometimes it's kind of normal. If this thing is bound up where you can't turn it at all, you got an issue. Pull it back apart and figure out what's going on. At this point here, we'll get our nose cone cap back on. On the O-ring, you can use some of this oil or use some dielectric grease or marine grease or something on it to help slide this in. And I want to remember, this was the top of the pump. We want to have this fill port facing up. I'm going to fill it, wiggle it around a little bit, rotate the prop, and just keep topping it off until it's full. Or at least at the bottom of the hole where the threads are. Once the oil is filled to the bottom of the hole, go ahead and put your filled plug back in. Now this has got tension on it. You don't need to crank it. It won't bottom out. So you just want to tighten it down until it's just about even with the plastic and it will not back out. If it's super loose and it feels like it's going to back out, put a couple of drops of blue Loctite on it. But I've never had to do that. Go ahead and put a little bit of grease on your splines. Don't overdo it because the shaft won't go in all the way. So at this point, this pump is rebuilt. We'll have all of our thrusts back. Let's just go ahead and get this thing back in our hull. I got the back of the hull and the pump shoe cleaned up. We're going to put our 140 millimeter neoprene ring in. Now this particular model where the water lines go through there's no seal, so what we need to do is just slather this up with some of this RTV. Two row rings go right here. I like to use a little dielectric grease or you can use some marine grease or something just to kind of hold them in place. Now I can go ahead and put my nozzle and reverse bucket back on. to change that switch out. But it seems like 
our acceleration problem is fixed with the jet, uh, jet pump sleeve replaced, the wear ring. While it was shutting down, um, I started to think that I was having some sort of an issue with a fuel delivery problem, uh, uh, creating a vacuum in the tank or something and not allowing the fuel to draw in. Um, I don't find any problems with that. Uh, just sitting on the dock, it seems to be fine, albeit when you rev it up, the engine seems to get pretty warm. So I'm wondering if while we're ripping this thing, the engine is getting hot. There's not many people out on the lake today, so I'm not really um, in any kind of mood of doing any long distance driving with this thing and uh, having to kind of paddle back. And maybe it's just the switch that's causing the problem. I don't know. It's frustrating. See if it's hot. Yeah, not crazy hot. So revving this thing up on a trailer uh, destroyed the bunk. And I was able to just kind of stick these in there to keep the supports from digging into the fiberglass. But we're going to have to replace them. Let's head off to our local home improvement box store. The original bunks on this trailer were five feet long. Obviously, we get a stick of a 10 foot two by four pressure treated, cut that right down the middle. I also got this PVC, I like using this instead of carpet for the top of the bunks. Super glidey, just got to be careful if you unhook the ski backing it down because it go without your uh, approval right into the water. And this was a 10 foot stick as well which I cut in half. So what I'm gonna do is prep these to be installed on our boards. And then once we get the ski back in the lake or I can get it off the trailer, we'll go ahead and replace the bunks out there. I'll just bring everything that I needed to. So I've got some, uh, I think they're number 10. Yeah, number 10 by inch and a half stainless steel screws. And we're gonna put eight of them in each board. So first thing I'm gonna do is get these set up and drill out for our eight Screws. Yeah, 
Hey Siri, what's 56 divided by 3? 56 divided by 3 is approximately 18.6666. Obviously, we don't want to have these screws sticking up as the jet ski rides over. It'll scratch the hull pretty good. So we want to countersink these to well, at least a quarter of an inch below the bottom. So we'll obviously have to countersink both of them. Super simple, that's gonna do it for our bunks with our new glides on there. We get out to the dock, we'll make some measurements as to where the mounts are for this. Drill some holes and drive these lags in and we're gonna be good to go on these. All right, so we're getting back on the diagnostics of the stalling issue and I think I found my problem. Now, misdiagnosing this as a potential fuel starvation problem could potentially have cost me an engine on this thing. Let me get you in here and show you what we got. So right underneath our carburetor here is our oil pump. Um, I did pull off the line, make sure that the oil was flowing, clean the filter. And whilst I was doing that, I noticed that the feed line from the pump up to the intake manifold is just simply not there. And if you look on the back side of the engine, same thing. That hose is not there. Now these lines are for the oil injection and keep the engine lubricated. So not having them there is detrimental. So I went ahead and picked up some new oil line. We're gonna get these installed and then get this thing back out to the lake and do a final lake test and make sure that everything's okay. And then clean it up and decide what our next step is gonna be with this, with this boat.
riding around out here for 10 minutes and other than the key consistently popping out i'm gonna fix that one of these days i've not had an issue with it whatsoever uh, no more dying out on me no more stalling turns out you lubricate the engine they don't lock up a little tip for you guys that's pretty much going to do it for this video i'm going to give it a good cleaning i doubt y'all are interested in that so i'll go ahead and do that off camera i want to thank you for watching i know a lot of you guys don't like the boat content uh, i work on what i got at the time and i like to share that with some people who may like the boat content but i definitely appreciate all of you thank you so much for your subscriptions thank you so much for your likes and your comments and even if you share it it's fantastic if you need a service manual for your boat dirt bike car refrigerator anything the e-manual online has great deals on them i put a link down in the description if you use my discount code resto rooster 22 you get 22 percent off until august 29th and 30th something like that end of august 2024 thanks so much for watching catch you on the next one